mid-sized Lionheart, part of the NATO maneuvers in Germany, are preparing for a mock enemy invasion. More than 130,000 British troops are taking part in the exercise. The first of the part-time soldiers mobilized to Germany have arrived with the units they're reinforcing. In exercise Lionheart, the enemy, called Orange, is due to invade from the east tonight. These men are reservists, former soldiers, mobilized for the first time and excused the attention of the army barber. One tactic being practiced more than ever this year is electronic warfare. Tomorrow, this landscape could be the front line, with the Orange attack coming from the right. Hidden amongst the trees is an enemy electronic warfare headquarters. The enemy is played here by the very British 14 Signal Regiment, but they are listening to VHF radio communications made by the defending Blue Forces. To the left of the front line, in a village, the defending guns have hidden themselves. Their observer is in front of them, looking east for approaching enemy tanks. He talks to a his guns by radio. Three batteries, a grid. A but the enemy is listening and scanning the frequencies. The message is analysed and concealed direction finding posts are alerted. Three listening posts by the trees in this sketch all detect the transmissions from the blue artillery spotter and by each taking a bearing on him can fix his exact position. The orange force tanks begin to invade and are seen by the blue observer. To stop the spotter telling his guns about the invading tanks, the orange enemy rushes its jammer into place and hurriedly builds its aerial. Within seconds, it can block the gunner's message. This use of electronic means to defeat an enemy has received relatively little attention from NATO forces until recently. But it will be practiced hard in this exercise, because it's known the Russians now use the technique extensively. The day began at RAF Wildenrath with a raid by saboteurs trying to cripple the Phantom Jets based there. The intruders were driven off with gusto by the RAF regiment, but they couldn't do anything about the next event, a low-level airstrike. As the firefighting parties and rescue teams coped with the fires and casualties, German territorial troops were on hand to repair the damage to Wildenrath's runways. But in an impressively short time, craters were filled and temporary steel matting was in place to make a rough but usable airstrip. Meanwhile, a hundred miles to the north, the 3rd Division was locked in battle with German Army Panzer Grenadiers. There was an air of unreality. The exercise is being held under strict rules of causing minimum inconvenience to the public. And it's not easy for troops who on paper are fighting World War III to take things seriously when they're surrounded by sightseers and when civilians are going about their normal business. This road bridge is one of the few remaining open for the withdrawal of British troops in the teeth of the enemy attack. When the last ones come through, it will be blown up, on paper that is. But will that demolition succeed? Will the tanks behind me manage to hold out long enough to keep the enemy at bay? Well, that's the sort of question that can only be decided by the umpires. Tonight, the 3rd Division is falling back under pressure from the advancing Germans. They've inflicted heavy casualties, but they've also sustained heavy losses. But in the way of exercises, everyone will be back. In the models, a Foreign Secretary Sir Geoffrey Howe and his West German counterpart, Hans Dietrich Genscher, visited the front lines. Our defence correspondent, Christopher Wayne, has been watching the action. This morning, the helicopters woke up Hessisch Oldendorf with the roar of battle. Hessisch Oldendorf is a nice small town which has the misfortune to lie on the river Weser. Today, special forces tried to blow up their bridge, but the men of Britain's territorial army were ready and waiting to slaughter the invaders with blanks and thunder flashes. There have been continual rows over who's been hit and who's survived, and the umpires are constantly on hand to give judgment. Let us, let us adjudicate that they can make 18 losses, 18 casualties. Okay. Meanwhile, to the east, the Territorials were also taking part in the defence of the Sibesa Gap, the main route for a tank assault. The 5th Battalion, the Queen's Regiment, are part-time soldiers from Kent. They call Kent the Garden of England, and so these soldiers have a natural affinity with the soil, which helps when you're spending most of your time below grass roots. The TA's strength is their enthusiasm, but why do they volunteer for a fortnight's misery like this? I enjoy doing as a hobby, and that's what it is. Some people go out into the garden and grow carrots, 
I come out and plant myself for a weekend or a fortnight in Germany. Life always appealed to me, been out in the open, and uh, I joined the TA yes, 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 as a report. Yes, 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 yes. Say what you will about chemical warfare, it certainly kills conversation. How much the ordinary German people like having their life disrupted by soldiers playing wars is another question. It's true that the children enjoy it, but then children always do. It's true that farmers get paid handsomely for damage to their crops. Indeed, they call the income the second harvest. But most ordinary people aren't farmers, and for them, exercises simply mean noise, inconvenience, and interminable delays on the roads. So they'll be glad when the weekend comes and Sebesa village can get back to its proper and peaceful existence. Next week, the war is due to... In any future European war, it's expected the Russians will use special forces to attack NATO supply lines. Today, the men of the 10th Battalion, the Parachute Regiment, were sent in on just such a mission. Their job today was to capture the village of Borkoshausen. The ammunition may have been blank, but the confusion was real enough. With a compass, I can work out which way I'm facing. No compass will tell me where I am. The map reading error which put them in the wrong place meant that the farmer hadn't been asked for permission, something neither he nor his cattle appreciated. Eventually it was all sorted out and the troops moved in through the quiet streets. By midday the town had been taken, though in a real shooting war every house would have been a fortress. Tomorrow Ten Para will have another mission. A hundred of them will be jumping over Arnhem, just as their grandfathers did 40 years ago. At Arnhem today, survivors of that battle were looking at the place where they'd fought. They'd tried to hold the bridge over the Rhine for a quick Allied sweep round to the heartland of German industry. Philip Hayton went with them to see where they'd battled and lost. They dropped in by coach, not parachute, onto the battlefields around Arnhem. In the corner of a cabbage field, they relive the heroism and the horror of Operation Market Garden. It was 40 years ago, but for many, the memories were so vivid, it seemed like yesterday. And that's where we dropped, right close to the trees. Some of them got, yeah, over by the farm, and some got stuck in the trees there. Yeah. Their old berets might be moth-eaten, but they're as spirited as ever. Some veterans say they're still haunted every day by what happened here, although many remember the funny things. I, I remember walking off this field uh, chewing a carrot. <laughs> yeah, uh, there was a load of carrots. Many of the comrades are dead, but their widows are assured they will never be forgotten. I can tell you that. We're missing. And it'll always be remembered. And it'll always be welcome to Arnhem. Yes, I know. As long as I'm here, I don't care. I, I, we're all comrades together. We're all a family. And you must realise this because we are devoted to each other. Yeah, I'll turn. No one bad, you got killed. That's right. Yeah. He buried him. That's right. Well, yeah. we were together. Do you remember me, Ned? Yes. Yeah. Bloody yeah. hell. We were taking they won't together. stop swapping the stories the until they head for home. The this out, afternoon right? at Sostyke Palace, some veterans met Prince Bernard, who led the Dutch resistance. General Robert Urquhart, whose division was almost completely destroyed, mustered his men for the prince. Mr. William. Mr. Gregory. Mr. Rushton. Thank you very much. I do the assault on Arnhem was a major defeat. These men lost a famous battle, but their dash and daring helped point the way to final victory. ground. It looks so alike the American tank because the Allies exchanged tank design and technology. They share the same high maneuverability. The armor, which is on the top secret list, has not yet been penetrated by any known missile. Today, they fought each other for the first time. The Americans fired first. As only 50 challengers are on the battlefield, much of the combat also involves Britain's aging chieftain. But to their cost, one crew came to an embarrassing halt in a ditch. They tried to tow it out but failed, and locals remonstrated at the damage to their farm track. One man with a broom even offered to clear up the mess. In a real war, the tank crews would have been destroyed. The army said Challenger performed exceptionally well. 
That pleases NATO, and Russian intelligence will doubtless pass back its performance to the other side of the German border. French Admiral War veterans have been remembering the battle for the bridge over the Rhine at Arnhem. In 1944, 35,000 troops from America, Poland and Britain failed to hold the key crossing with heavy casualties. The bridge at Arnhem today, peaceful, almost empty. Forty years ago, it echoed to the roar of one of the most savage battles of the war. Today, the survivors of that battle, men of the British 1st Airborne Division, came back to honour their dead and pay tribute to their courage. Some walked to the memorial, part of the original Arnhem Bridge. Some made the journey in wheelchairs. At their head, their commanders. On the right, General Urquhart, who led the 1st Airborne. By his side, General Frost, who, with about 500 men, held this, the north end of the bridge, for four days until forced to surrender. An original Arnhem paratrooper, 66-year-old Tex Banwell, dropped again today and recalled the horrors of 40 years ago. And in my own plane, there were about 10 or 12 men dead in the, on the floor who uh, had been shot with small arms fire, machine gun fire. And of course, all parachuters for sitting targets once they're in the air. So uh, a lot of people were, were killed, although they jumped and the parachutes were open, they were dead in their harness. One highlight of the day was a mass drop by men of the parachute regiment onto the same heath where the original landings took place so long ago. In their struggle to seize the Rhine bridges, the British were outnumbered and encircled and could not be reached by ground troops advancing from the south. Today, as Philip Hayton reports, their parachute drop was reconstructed. In the skies above Arnhem, 60 men of the parachute regiment staged a commemorative drop onto Ginkel Heap, codename Drop Zone Y. About 10,000 men of the 1st Airborne Division landed 40 years ago. It was the greatest airborne operation ever. Prince Bernard followed it with interest today, just as he had done then. Only this time, it all went off without a hitch. Leaders of the Dutch resistance, who did so much to help the British wartime survivors, laid a wreath. The pain and pride of 40 years ago was plain to see, as the Dutch handed out a carnation to every veteran they could find. The bloodiest battle of the First World War, Verdun in Paris, has been commemorated at a ceremony which marks a symbolic reconciliation between France and Germany. President Mitterrand of France and the West German Chancellor, Herr Kohl, paid homage to the many thousands who died 68 years ago. From Verdun, John Simpson. This is the killing ground of Verdun, the highest density of dead per square mile in the history of warfare in the longest single battle ever fought. 700,000 Germans and French died during the 10 months it lasted in 1916. After it, France was exhausted and German morale never recovered. There were no victors. Everywhere you go on this battlefield, you find the debris of war, from the rusting pieces of iron like this to little pieces of bone which are everywhere. One man has the job of going out every day to pick up the human remains and taking them to the ossuary or bone house at the top of the hill.